are the solution to somebody's, you're the solution to, uh, or you're the answer to somebody's question. You're the solution uh, to somebody's problem. And we don't have a long time tonight, but I want to get into something tonight. I don't know what I want to call this presentation. I don't know if it's a sermon, Dr. Lawrence. I don't know if it's a presentation. I don't know if it's a hybrid of preaching and teaching. Um, uh, I, I don't know what it is. I want to just kind of give it how God gave it to me. And, um, and then we'll go from there and then we'll have a conversation. And I want to use, um, to begin our conversation tonight, I want to use a text of scripture that has become one of my favorite stories in scripture. It really has. I want to go to what has become one of my favorite verses of scripture and not often heard story, but it's become um, a story that I just love to read, to talk about, to teach about. And I want you to go, if you can, if you have your Bibles to the book of Judges. And there in chapter 11, we're going to find what will highlight and heighten our discussion this evening, Judges uh, 11. And I want to read uh, maybe about eight or so verses. Powerful story. Now, Jephthah, the Gilead, Gilead from Gilead was a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. And Gilead was the father of Jephthah. And Gilead's wife bore him sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out of the house and said to him, don't miss this. You're not going to have any of uh, our father's inheritance. You're not going to have an inheritance in our father's house because you're the son of a prostitute. You're the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob and worthless rebels, some versions say, or worthless fellows followed him and they went around him. And it came about after a while that the sons of Amnon fought against Israel. The Ammonites fought against the Israelites. And it happened that when the sons of Ammon fought against Israel, that the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah out of the land of Tah. And they said to Jephthah, can you catch this? I hope y'all can catch this tonight. I'm, I'm probably getting too excited too early, but can you catch this in verse six? They said to Jephthah, come be our chief. Come lead us that we might fight against the Ammonites. Are you kidding me? That's what it says. Y'all forgive me. I need my Bible to preach. They said, can you be our leader? Now, these are the, these the fellas that kicked him out. But then once they got into a fight, they said, can you come be our Leader And Jephthah said to them, verse 7, to the elders of Gilead, Did, aren't you the ones <laughs> that kicked me out of my father's house? How come you coming to get me now because you're in trouble? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, for this reason, we have now returned to you that you may go fight with us, the sons of Ammonites, and become our leader and lead us to victory. And the subject that Dr. Lawrence gave me to talk about is who am I? That's, that's what I want to talk about for a few minutes. Tonight, I want to, by the grace of God, share something powerful that if you stick with me, I believe will change the literal trajectory of your life. Because if you haven't known it, realized it by now, you should have for the over two years now, we have had to figure out life a little differently. We've gone through ups, downs. We've gone from the extremes of total quarantine and stay-at-home orders to a quasi-return of certain gatherings. And depending on where you live, depending on what government you fall under, 
Some have adjusted mask wearing and COVID testing requirements. But through the ebb and flow of what we've been through, one thing is for sure, one thing is for certain. Since 2020, our lives have been impacted in such a way and our lives will never be the same. And I'm beginning here, I'm beginning with this tonight because honestly, I believe, I really do, Dr. Lawrence, that before we get through this thing called COVID-19, before we process through and transition through the final vestiges of COVID-19, whenever that is, whenever we, we finally get through the final vestiges of this thing that has changed our lives, there are some critical decisions that you and I are gonna have to make. Please sit up whenever you uh, listen to this. If you listen to the rebroadcast or if you're watching right now, I, I want you to pull up. I want you to get ready. I want you to turn up the volume a little bit. I need you to hunker down there with me because there's some critical decisions that you and I are gonna have to make before this thing is all over. Because since the world pandemic began, one of the things that's been on the top of my list is this. I hope you hear me tonight. I don't want to come out of this the same person. Boy, I hope y'all catch this with me tonight. I, I, I don't want, this is not a revival. This is not a special Wednesday night prayer meeting we've been in. This has been an over two, a two plus year global pandemic. We have never seen the likes of this thing before. And I'm telling you, before this thing is all over, you, you, you're going to have to make some critical decisions. You're going to have to reconcile some things in your life that were happening before 2020 that God has allowed all of us the opportunity and the privilege to press what I would call a reset button. He, he's given us all the grand privilege to, 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 to kind of change and to shit. I don't want to come. I'm, I forget y'all right now. I'm sorry. That, that was mean. This is the Sabbath. Um, let me talk to myself for a few seconds. I don't want to come out of this thing the same way. I don't want to come out the same person. I, I want to come out different. I, I want to, I want to come out charting a new path for my life. And if it, it, my time ain't gone yet, Dr. Lawrence is it? I, I know I'm just getting into this thing. I'm getting happy too early, but if I have to experience a global pandemic, then let it mean something in my life. Okay, y'all are not, I, I, I see some of y'all on the Zoom. Y'all don't want to talk to me, but I, I'm going to go ahead because I know I know this is meeting good season. God gave this thing to me when I'm going to share with you tonight. I, I, if, if I got to go through it, let it at least mean something. Let me at least learn from it. See, you, you, you ought never waste a storm. You, you ought never waste a difficult moment in your life. If you have to go through it, and, and, and please understand, you have to. If you got to endure it, and please understand, you've got to go through something. Let me at least, let me at least come away from it a better person. Don't let it take me under. Don't let it wipe me out, but allow it to grow me. Allow it to develop me. And for some of you, who may have lost yourself because of COVID. For some of you who may have lost yourself in the shuffle, for, for some of you don't, don't even know who you are anymore because of what you've been going through. For those of you who have dealt with depression while in COVID, and for those of you who may have had thoughts of suicide because of the separation, I hope God help me talk to your people tonight. For those who have battled through job loss or transition, have had to transition to another job, for those who have dealt with sickness and and, 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 and sadness, uh, death and disease while in COVID. For those of you, my brothers and sisters who have had to weather the storm and deal with isolation and illness of confusion and cynicism. If during COVID, you've had to brave uncertainty and apprehension, if you had to struggle through all of that before I press on through the rest of what I came to present on tonight, before I press on, 
to what I really came to talk about tonight, I got to do one thing, Doc Lawrence. You, you, you forgive me. I'm sorry. I got to do one thing before I talk about the meat and the meaning of what I came to talk about tonight. I got to do one thing before I press on. Can I do that real quick, Dr. Lawrence? If you shake your head, I promise I'll do it. I got to do one thing before I press on. I got to do one thing before I move on. I must applaud you. Matter of fact, go ahead and take 30 seconds right now to clap for yourself if you've had to endure anything on the list I just gave you. Go ahead and take 30 seconds if you have had to endure a rough uh, two plus years, go ahead and clap for yourself. Go ahead and hug yourself. Go ahead and pat yourself on the back. Go ahead and celebrate yourself. Go ahead and dance for yourself. Go ahead, because this is so critical and crucial to address before I move on, because some of you are so wounded from your last season that you can't embrace your next season. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me tonight. Some of us are so wounded from the two years that we've been entitled to endure that you can't embrace your next. And and before you embrace what's next, you ought to take stock and inventory of everything that has happened in the last two years. And before I press on, how many can say that if God never does one more thing, how he's kept you in these last two years is already enough? Y'all, okay, y'all don't want to clap for yourself. I said, if God don't do one more thing in your life, how he's kept you in such a wonderful way has already been enough. And it's a terrible thing when you are so broken and so fatigued from your last season that you can't fully embrace and appreciate what God has in store for you in the next season. And that's why I got to take time out, Doc Lawrence. I got to take time to celebrate you, to congratulate you, to applaud you based on your previous season, not taking you out because if you've had to endure and survive, if you have survived over the last two years, watch this, you are doing better than you realize. Okay. See, see, okay. Whew, I'm trying to calm down, Doc Lawrence, because so many of you have been so hard on yourself. So many of you have been so difficult on yourself and been so demeaning on yourself. Who am I? You have been putting yourself down over the last two years. But if you survive, I said I wasn't going to preach, Dr. Lawrence, but I feel the power of God in this virtual space. If you survived over the last two years, you are doing better than you realize. Go ahead and clap for yourself. Go ahead, give yourself a hug. Send yourself a text message. I know folk think you're crazy, but I'm telling you, the last two years could have taken you and the last two years should have taken you out. But he's kept you. And one of the tricks of the enemy, one of the tricks of the enemy and one of the things that he is good at, I believe in this season, is to have us focus so much on negativity that we can't even count the many and wonderful things that God is doing in your life. And we get so stuck on the negativity in the news and the negativity on social media and focus on the negativity that we have no control over. And we can no longer be thankful for what God is doing. So before I get into the nuts and bolts of what I came to talk about, before I get into the nuts and bolts of today's presentation, can I give you just three reasons to celebrate? Can I do that? Some, somebody ought to put a heart emoji up to the something. Can I just give you three reasons why you ought to thank God right now? Just, just three reasons real quick. This, this ain't got nothing to do really what I came to talk about, or maybe it does, but three reasons why you ought to thank God. Here it is, the first one. You are still here. Okay, see, I can really say, now nah, I lay me down to sleep. I praise the Lord, my soul to keep. I, I can really uh, bid you all farewell right now and say blessed Sabbath day and, and, and see y'all the next time. Dr. Lawrence, you can invite me back and I can finish the rest of this presentation. After what I just said, you ought to, act, you should have acted a fool in front of God. You should have uh, thrown up your hands and said, thank you, Jesus. First reason you can thank God 
It's because you're still here. You are alive. You made it. You got it. Do you know how many, how many funerals that I've had to do? Do you know how many people got buried in the last two years? I ain't just talking about COVID. I'm talking about the rest of the stuff that's been taking people out. But you are still here. If you are listening to me talk to you right now, if you can hear with your ears what I'm saying right now, if you can lift your hands and say, thank you, Jesus, if you can open up your mouth and say, God, you're wonderful, you ought to thank God because you are still here and what took out others didn't take out you. You are still here. Can, can I give you the second reason to thank God? I'm getting excited too early, Doc Lawrence. I need to calm myself down. Somebody get me out of here. Uh, here here's a second reason you can praise God. Um, some, to some of y'all, this is going to be mediocre and mundane, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. It's another reason you can praise God. Here it is. Um, you have a place to stay. Okay. Uh, yeah. I uh, see some of y'all only praise God for, for cars, for a new boo, for, for some money in your pocket. Um, but thank God you got a roof over your head. I was driving, I was in Los Angeles, California about a week ago, and I was walking down the street and just saw tents of people who, who, who were not camping out, but they were living outside. They had no place to stay. When it rained, they got rained on. But you ought to thank God if you're Rick, if you got a pillow to lay your head tonight and there's a roof over your head. Okay, I'm see, I'm I'm talking. I hope I ain't talking to no bougie Christians right now who think that everything you got is owned owed to you and, and whatever you had came at the work of your hands. But how many know it's not been your job that has kept you, and it's not been your paycheck that's kept you, it's been the Lord who has kept you in such a wonderful, a wonderful and marvelous way. It's been the Lord who has kept the roof over your head, a Lord that has kept gas in your car. The Lord, okay, okay, I'm sorry. Here, here, here's the third reason. Third reason why you ought to praise God because God hasn't let everything fall apart in your life. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Something in your life is working for your good, but for his glory. Yeah, I, I know it might've been rough. I know the two years may have been difficult, but everything ain't falling apart. Uh, uh, you may not have this, but at least you got this and that. He might have walked out on you, but at least you're getting a good night's sleep. You might have got fired, but at least all your bills are paid. And I'm just, I just need two people. I, I, just, I don't need everybody on here. I just need two people to praise God that at least God won't let everything fall apart in your life at the same time. And I want to celebrate the fact that in spite of everything going on in your life, and in spite of everything you've been going through, you are still here. Don't you dare allow the enemy to steal moments of praise and moments of joy from you. You, you matter. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to put move on, Doc Lawrence, but I, it's hard for me. It's, it's hard out here being a preacher. You, you, you have earned the right to praise God. You have earned the right to give God thanks. You have earned the right to say glory. After all you've been through, you deserve to tell God how wonderful he is. Yeah, yeah, he's been, whew, he, he's been good. But as much as you are here, as much as you are here, some things you would argue may have gotten in the way or lost in the shuffle during COVID. The essence of who you are, the essence of who you were created to be has gotten swallowed up in the previous season of your life. And what do you do when you don't even recognize who you are anymore? Ooh, that's, that's, that's tough. How, what, what, what do you do when you look in the mirror and you don't like the reflection looking back at you? Who, who are you? You, 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 you struggle with in, in this season. How do you chart a path forward while still being confused about where you are. And I want to use an interesting but informative story that we read earlier in the book of Judges that highlights and heightens what I want to share tonight. Judges 11 shows us a story of a young man in Israel named Jephthah who has seemingly been having issues with walking confidently in who he is and struggles with what life means based on his seasons or the seasons of his past. The Bible calls him a mighty warrior, but his mother is a prostitute. He's 
a person known for his fighting ability, and yet he's gossiped about heavily in Israel because his mother has earned a living sleeping with men who would pay for her sexual services. The context seems to suggest that as he grows up, his biological mother sends him to live with his father to give her freedom and flexibility for her business. And while he's living with his father, while he's living at his father's house, his father marries another woman who has other sons and they all live in this one house together. But these half brothers have a problem with Jephthah because every time they see him, it causes them frustration because his presence in the house and their connection to him is embarrassing to their status in Israel. And one day they couldn't take it any longer. They couldn't take it anymore. They kick him out of the house and they say to him in no uncertain terms, you won't be getting any of our father's inheritance. And the reason you won't is because your mother is a prostitute. And what's interesting is that his own father does not stop the, the, his eviction. His own father does not come to his defense and his stepmother watches his dismissal from the land. <laughs> He's already in therapy for his mother giving up on him to go live with another family. And social scientists say that when your mother doesn't love you, doesn't nobody like you. He didn't ask to be born. He didn't ask to live in this family and in this situation. And yet the only family that he's known rejects him and pushes him out the house. He's a mighty warrior. And yet it seems like nobody wants him. He's a good fighter, but he's been fighting all of his life just to survive. Because if you haven't figured it out by now, regardless of how many positive attributes you have, there will always be at some level, some opposition in your life. In spite of how many yeses that you receive, there will always be that one no you get that will break the core of who you are. The level of opposition and your amount of pain is usually proportional to the great plans that God has for your life. There will always be something, regardless of what you've achieved, that presses and pushes you and even confuses you and makes you think differently about God because instead of God allowing your life to singularly be abundantly blessed and for you not to experience these frustrations and hurdles and difficulties and breakups and pink clips and COVID and divorce and death and disease and confusion and bad news, uh, he gets all of it. And I wish to God that my life would be the equivalent of flowers and sunshine all the time. But instead of God allowing you to singularly experience that, the Lord makes you to perform a tour of duty and pain and will orchestrate the circumstances of your life where you pass through defeat and despair so that when he brings you back from what knocked you down, you are now believable and have authority and have power and have street cred and be able to look the devil in the face and say, if I survive that, y'all are not hearing me tonight. If I survive that, then I can get through anything. Y'all are not hearing me. In other words, you're saying tonight, devil, if I get through COVID, you ain't going to be able to stop me. Somebody ought to agree with me in the spirit. If I get through this season, I can get through anything. If I can get through the cancer, if I can get through the divorce, if I can get through the prison time and the season of depression, if I can get through the grief that I thought would overtake my soul, if I can get through anything, if I can get through what I thought was going to take me out, somebody needs to get an I wish you would anointing. Based on how you got through COVID, based on how you survived, people leaving your life, if you get through Whew, okay, all right. Jephthah, Jephthah, in his rejection, runs from his father's house. He's the oldest son and entitled to the inheritance, but is forced from his father's house to go live in the land of Tob. And some of you are wondering why he just didn't stay in his father's house and fight for what rightfully belonged to him. And I wish I had time to talk about not staying around people who don't value what's in you because one day they'll wake up and realize what they lost. I just said something that you just missed. I wish I had time. I really wish I did. I got to keep pressing, Doc Lawrence. I wish I had time to talk about 
how you shouldn't stay around people who don't value what's in you because sooner or later, later or sooner, they're going to wake up and realize what they lost. It goes to the land of Tob where a group of brothers who, who are not too polished start hanging around him. And while he's there settling into a new life, a fight breaks out between the sons of Ammon and Israel. And it's clear that Israel isn't strong enough to deal with this battle. And while they're fighting, they hear that Jephthah is hanging out in the land of Tob. So the elders travel back to the land of Tob to get Jephthah. And they say to him, can you catch this? And they say to him, can you really imagine somebody telling you this? They say to him, can you come back and be our leader and lead us in fighting the sons of Ammon? And Jephthah responds to the elders of Gilead and says, hold up, hold up, hold on, hold on, time out, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Aren't you the brothers that hated on me and kicked me out of my daddy's house? How come you want me now? The question that I pause as I reflect on who are we and who we're going to be as we come out of COVID, it's, it's one that begs our attention tonight because if you're like me, you don't wanna come out of COVID the same way. And despite of everything you've had to endure since you've been in COVID, it does not negate what God wants to do in you. And I wanna back into this text by asking or watching and looking and seeing what the text is telling to teach us. And that is, number one, God, somebody put this in the chat, orchestrates the details of your life. Now, what I, what I, just, what I just said didn't mean a whole lot to some of y'all, but if you caught what I just said, you will be thanking God. Some of y'all will be crying. You will be shouting glory that God orchestrates the details of your life, regardless of the ebbs and flows, regardless of what you're going through, regardless of what you had to endure. Can you catch this and be mature enough to understand as bad it is as it has been, God has been orchestrating the details of your life. Every tear you've had to cry, every pain you've had to endure, every stress you've had to, God orchestrates. He's behind it. Here's the second one, though, and this should bless you. Pain is often what God uses to push you into purpose. <laughs> Make no mistake about it. There's one thing the Bible does teach. It's the fact that God arranges. He choreographs. He directs the details of our lives. And this piece of the picture of God who is can be rather difficult and hard to digest when considering the fact that God's arrangement of the song of our life does not singularly include pretty notes. But if I'm honest, some of the seasons that you have personally experienced in life, including some dark and difficult times, and it has been problematic to honestly understand what God has been doing for years, particularly during COVID. And we've done a poor job of painting the full picture of God so that we can understand that even in difficulty, God is behind it, that the devil doesn't just orchestrate bad things and God doesn't just orchestrate good things. So much so that we will only attribute positive things that happen to us are orchestrated by God and then conversely, everything negative that we experience as directed by the hand of the devil. But time and maturity teach us that viewing the spirit realm from that lens is extremely shallow because it gives a faulty perspective that what attempts to grow us or bring about our demise will solely come through the lens of what appears to be good or bad. So we arrive at these conclusions that there is no way that God would direct me in this way and God wouldn't dare allow me to experience such hurt, pain, or loss. Uh-uh, no, no, absolutely not. Not my God. He wouldn't do me like this. God, God wouldn't send me into this. 
God wouldn't allow this, but I've discovered in my life but that some of the most pain-filled drinks that I've had to digest were things orchestrated by the powerful and mighty hand of God. And then we'll spend time in prayer, praying prayers like, God, if this is you, then allow this door to be open so that all I have to do is walk in it. God, if this is you, open this door so wide so that all I have to do is walk into the miracle. But I'm here to tell you tonight, I'm here to tell you today that I've walked in some wide open doors that I knew the devil designed for my destruction. Why you want me now, they said. Ain't you the ones that kicked me out of the land? I, I've been stuck in top this whole time. And just because you got in a fight, you want me to come back home and help you fight? For this reason, we've come to get you, they said, to help us fight our enemy. Now, I'm glad I wasn't Jephthah, Doc, Doc Lawrence, because um, Jephthah could have said one of two things, which most of us do. I know my time is getting, I, I got some more time, Doc Lawrence. Okay. He could have said, you know what? I'm not going back to help people who did me wrong. If I can be honest, I hope the enemies will kill all of them and that God vindicates me so that I can finally feel justified for how I've been feeling for all of these years. And that someone would finally recognize that I was done wrong. I'm not coming back to the place of pain to help them. I want to see them suffer. Matter of fact, I really should have lost my mind out here in top. I really should have lost my mind during COVID. Y'all are not hearing me tonight. I, I really should have lost my mind during these last two plus years. But aren't you glad that when you should have lost your mind and been committed to a mental hospital, that God kept you in the palm of his hand? And the reason why you didn't lose your mind is because you needed your mind for what God had planned for you in the next season of your life. You know what? I know this might sound weird. I know this might sound a lot odd, but I want you to go ahead and talk to the devil right now. And I want you to tell the devil, you know what? My bad, devil. My bad. I'm sorry. I want you to go ahead and apologize to him. Because I go ahead and tell the devil, you know what, devil? I lost my mind for a little while. I can't lie. You had me for a little while. For about three months of COVID. For about six months of COVID, you had me. I was depressed. I was saddened. But I'm back now. And since I've got my mind back, I can look at you in the face. And I can look at people who did me wrong and say, I don't got time to waste on people who were too spiritually immature to miss what God was doing in my life. And I need somebody to agree with me in the spirit like Jephthah did and said, you know what? I got my fight back. That's where I'm going. After, after oh my God, after quarantine, after COVID, after the stay at home quarters, I got my fight back. That's who I want you to be. I want you to come out of COVID saying, I got my fight back. Because here's the reality. Most of us, we're on a slippery slope out of purpose even before COVID started. Okay, y'all don't want to be honest. Let's be honest. Most of y'all weren't doing anything worthwhile before COVID. You were just going along to get along. Then COVID hit. You were stuck at home. Oh, I can't wait till this is over. Oh, I want to be out. I, I, I want. Hey, I got a question. For all y'all, I want to be out, Pope, people. Where you going? Okay, yeah, okay, y'all don't want to be honest. Uh, where are you going? Uh, and I'm asking where are you going because what you gonna do? Spending a hundred dollars shoes, but ain't going nowhere. And we're frustrated because we have been so relegated to what we were doing that all we've been saying is, I want to go back. I want to go back to do what I was doing before. Watch this, which was nothing. That's why, y'all forgive me, I'm freeing myself since I ain't at my own church. I do see one of my members on, so if if, if, if she starts telling on me in church, y'all pray for my strength, I might have to move to London. Hey, hey, that's, that's why I can't stand when members say, I want to go back. I want to go back to when, hey, my brothers and sisters, I don't want to go back. In fact, in fact, I, 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 was, I was Doc Lawrence, I was struggling between sharing this and sharing another 
uh, text of scripture that I'm still working on, haven't worked out because I believe if you all can catch this, that the cloud has moved. God is not interested in sending us back. He's only interested in taking us forward. And many of us, my brothers and sisters, we are struggling so much to be free from the last season that we cannot embrace what God is doing in our next season. And I would to God that we would like uh, Jephthah, shake off the draws and shake off the feelings and get over yourself of thinking that you just gonna go back to what was. God is saying, I'm trying to take you forward into a new dimension and new things and new love and new zeal and new purpose. Now, now, let me get into to some teaching. Let me get into a little teaching and then, then we'll go to the Q&A, Doc Lawrence. Be, because I, I, wanna, I wanna start with this. I wanna start with something that you may have missed in the text. The Bible says Jephthah was a warrior, but his mother was a prostitute. Now, now, there is never a waste for words in the Bible. The Bible uses certain things to emphasize certain things. Jephthah was a mighty warrior, but his mother was a prostitute. And it's almost as if the emphasis is more about his mother being a prostitute than he is being a warrior. He's a warrior, and yet he has to fight through so much. It's interesting because names or words have power. Can you imagine? Well, you could probably do more than imagine because as Jephthah was in the community of Israel, all Israel knew that his mother was a prostitute. Can you imagine how they talked about Jephthah they didn't probably call him Jephthah. They called him the prostitute's son. Because, Doc Lawrence, isn't that what we do in church? Don't we call people by what they do instead of their name? We don't call them their name. We call them the oops baby. We call them the out of wedlock child. We, we, we call them by how we want to identify with them. And I want you to take a few minutes. I'm going somewhere as I close. I want to take a few minutes to ask three pivotal questions. What are some names that people have called you? Yeah, I, I, want, I want you to scroll the Ro Rolex of your life and think about the names people have called you. Names because of things that happen uh, in your life uh, that you had no control over things. He, he, he didn't tell his mother to, to go in this business, and yet he's, he's given this name, he's given this tag over his life. And how many of you like me know that there have been some times and seasons and moments in your life that people have put names on you and they have labeled you with those names. And watch this, for some of us, we have never been able to come up out under those names. No matter how many degrees you get, no matter how good you do in life, no matter how much money you achieve, no matter how big your house is, they still call you those names. Is anybody listening to me tonight? The names that people have called you that have, that, that have, that have fueled who you think you are. But here's the second question I gotta ask, because it's not just the names that people have called you. Um, can you catch this? Um, what are some of the names that you've called yourself? When the sun goes down and the moon is low and your head is on your pillow, and your mind slips itself into an unconscious state and tears stain your pillow. What are some of the names that you have called yourself? Everybody thinks you're wonderful, but you call yourself another name. 
Everybody thinks you're doing well, but you have put labels over your own life that have limited your full potential. In fact, these names that we give ourselves are so important because we've made these names as hashtags or we turn these names into Instagram handles or Snap handles or it's our name. People can't even find your real name on social media because you put the name that you identify as. And that's why what's so powerful in this is this last category because, oh, I hope this is, oh, God, Doc Lawrence, I, I may have to end after this. I got, I got, I got about five more minutes to go, but I, I'm getting excited because it's really not about the names that other people have called you. And it's really, that doesn't matter the names that you've called yourself, but, but, but can somebody catch this tonight? What does God call? Okay. Woo. What, 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 what does God call you child of God? What, what does God call you? You're a victor, not a victim. What, what, what does God call you? Because Whatever God calls you has power. Whatever God calls you has meaning. Whatever God calls you has purpose. He'll call you a name based on what he wants to do with you. Here it is. I, 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 feel, I feel God in this virtual space. God, God calls him a mighty warrior based on how God wants to ultimately use him. Okay, y'all are not catching this. He calls us names based on how he sees us. Um, pastor, preacher, doctor, can you give me another uh, illustration for that? I sure can. Y'all remember your boy Joseph? <laughs> the Bible says that his father said, go check up on your brothers and see what they're doing. And the Bible says that he goes and takes them some food. I feel my help right now. I was getting tired, Dr. Lawrence, but I feel my help right through here when I just finished this, this funeral and I was getting a little tired, but I feel my help on this because Joseph goes and sees his brothers. And as his brothers, the Bible says, see him coming in a distance. They say to him, look, here comes the dreamer. Y'all missed what I just said. They, they say, look, here comes the dreamer. They, they, they don't even, okay, y'all still ain't got it. You're slow, but I'm trying to wait for you. They say, look, here comes the dreamer. They don't even call Joseph by his biological name. They, they don't even call him by what's on his birth certificate. They call him by what God gave him because even your enemies got to bow down. Even your enemies got to recognize what God is doing in your life. God gives you a name based on how he wants to use you. He's a mighty warrior. And when Israel gets in a the fight, they say, they say, they say, hey, 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 we, we, we need somebody that can fight because, because um, when it's time to fight, you don't need a hairdresser. Okay, y'all okay. gonna make me turn this internet on. When, 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 when it's time to fight, you don't need a barber. When, when it's time to fight, you don't need an auto mechanic. Oh, maybe you do. When, when it's time to fight, you don't need a scientist. When it's time to fight, you don't need a doctor. But when it's time to fight, you need somebody who can fight. And y'all ain't all gonna understand this. But there's a few of us who know how to put the Vaseline on our face and know how to throw. I know we're not all Floyd Mayweather, but but there's a few of us that know how to put the Vaseline on our face and know how to throw up our dukes and say, for God I live and for God I die. When it was time to fight, they had to find somebody who can fight. And watch this, God gave him the one thing that was needed. Do you realize that God has put in you at least one thing that's needed on the earth? Whew. Do you realize right now, God has already put in you one thing that's needed on the earth. But because you're so hung up from the last season, you can't see it. Who am I? A better, more fitting question might be, how would I like to engage life? So let me end with these four questions. Remember I said at the beginning, there's some questions, there's some things that we're going to have to decide on. And at the heart of these four questions is where I want to suggest you need to put your energies in after COVID. You have been putting your energy 
my brother and my sister in the wrong thing. You have been putting your energy in the wrong thing. You have been putting your energy in people, places, and things that have holes in buckets. Uh, Y'all don't remember this song, there's a hole in my bucket. Dear Liza, dear Liza. Okay, all right. Here, 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 Here are the three things, four things that I think if you can catch the essence of this, you'll find you'll, you, you'll find what to put your energies into in this next season. Four questions. Here's the first one. What are you interested in? What? What piques your interest? What? What, what heightens your, your senses and your sensibilities? Here's number two. What are you excited about? And listen, I, I ain't talking about that new show that, that, that you just got, that, that show on Netflix that you about to binge watch or Hulu. I can't make no friends in here tonight. Number three, what are you driven by? In other words, what causes you to get out of the bed in the morning? And my brother and sister, I don't know who I'm talking to, but you were not created and I'm, listen, I'm not talking about paying your bills. I'm not telling you you got to quit your job, but you were not created to solely work a nine to five job. You were created that your life might bear witness to the majesty and glory of God. What drives you? What's that thing that, 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 that you would love to get out of the bed in the morning to do, even if you weren't getting paid? And that's the last question I want to arrive at. What are you burdened for? What are you interested in? What are you excited about? What are you driven by? What are you burdened for? That's where I believe God has taken us after COVID. That we be not mere reflectors of other men's thoughts, but that God would birth in us and do in us a new thing. And maybe it's really not a new thing. Maybe it's the thing he was been trying to get us to do all along. But because we've been so burdened down and and, and hunkered down in our last season, we couldn't see it. But if COVID has taught us anything, I think it's taught us God has been trying to get our attention in many ways. And I told God last year, I said, listen, you got my attention. (laughs) This, This thing called, you got me. And I pray by the spirit of God that we will begin ordering our steps in his word in his will, and in his way. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. Wow. Wow. That was powerful, Doc. Bless you, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. What are you interested in? What are you excited about? Yes. What are you driven? What is it that drives you? What are you driven by? What are you driven by? What are you burdened for? Yes. Four cardinal questions. Decided your purpose in this world. Oh, yes. We will allow now um, Nuzi to monitor this section. Perhaps tell us what you thought about this session tonight. Um. I read, I'm kind of blown away, you know, because there's so many things to think about there. Um, Mm. That whole idea, I think, you know, the one that struck me was, you know, listen to negative voices, but it's one thing to listen to, and this is something that we hear all the time. It's one thing to hear negative voices from other people, but it's the things that you tell yourself, you know, and trying to build that, 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 you know, that God confidence, you know, God's confidence in yourself. That is like, you know, that's the one thing that I think is so hard for a lot of people to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you have questions, guys, honestly, this is the time, put your questions in the chat. Or if you wanna ask a question, you can put your hand up and you can ask it directly. But what, what, what do you, is it possible for us to build confidence in others? You know, you know those people who are always like, you know, 
oh, I'm terrible. I'm just, you know, no matter, even though they're doing amazing things, you know, they, 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 they're great at their jobs, they're confident speakers, they're good at, you know, but then they just have that, they just don't have that, that how do we build that confidence in people and even in ourselves, you know, how do we, what are the practical ways that we can do that? So I think you just asked five questions without realizing it. Um, where can I start? I think, um, I think we put too much pressure on ourselves by thinking that we have the power to build someone's confidence because based on how somebody's wired, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, you can, you can give them compliments 20 times a day and it still not be enough. Um, you know, one, one, one of the favorite um, taglines I love to say is that uh, your adulthood is unpacking your childhood, right? And for some of us, we were, we were told for so long a lie about ourselves that when someone tells us the truth, we believe that to be a lie. And so um, it is. It's really a work of heart and allowing the Holy Spirit to help us to realize what is truth and what is error and help us to realize that some people were not or are not healthy enough to tell us the truth about ourselves, right? So some people were, are, are, are not, were not healthy enough to tell their children, you're beautiful, you're wonderful, you're going to be great. They just weren't for whatever reason, healthy enough to do that. And so sometimes it takes time for, for, for us to get around people that, that would do that. You know, you, the second thing I would say, <laughs> get you a, <laughs> this is terrible English, and I shouldn't be talking like this because I, I do have a terminal degree, doc, uh, uh, Lawrence, but get, your, get yourself around some people that can love you and tell you the truth about yourself. Like I, I coined this phrase last year, man. If your if your crew is trash, you're gonna be taking out a lot of garbage because you need to make sure you are around people that can pour into you and you can pour into them and they can tell you the truth about yourself. So when you talk about practical, um, you know, ways, you you know getting that good friend circle um, is a real practical way. Um, you know, people you can trust, Hey man, tell me, tell me about, you know, people that can encourage you and not just, not just telling you something you want to hear, but, but telling you the truth. I was with one of my best friends the other day and I said to him, I said, man, you are a really good father, man. And he looked at me and smiled. He said, why you said, I said, man, because you are. I said, I'm not just blowing smoke uh, uh, to you. I said, man, I'm, I'm seeing you with your kids and seeing you interact with them and your patience with them. I said, dude, bro, bro, I don't know if I got that much patience with my own kids. I'm looking at you like, man, I need to, I need to raise my bar. But, but getting around people that can, that can love on you and tell you the truth and be honest, um, for some people, you talk about practical, but for some people, it takes clinic, literally clinical and spiritual help to get them to the place of knowing what was true about myself and what was false about myself so that I can start understanding and deciphering what is true and what is false now in my adult uh, season of life. Yeah, thank you. And just to, um, obviously, like we work a lot with like families and, you know, family ministries. And one of the questions that we get quite a lot is, you know, so, yeah, okay, so understanding like you're like maybe the people who raised you were probably not in the right place to raise you and give you that confidence. But how about, you know, now you kind of, you've grown up with that confidence, you get married, you're in a relationship, you're settled, but then you've got new family members so maybe your mother-in-law your father-in-law who's always putting you down so how do you deal with that then you know because you can't exactly say well I'm just going to like or can you just shut them out you know like can you put barriers between those family members if they are always negative 
So I wouldn't say barriers, but I would say boundaries is a better word. Um, you know, if you if you're talking specifically about in-laws, your children should not hear um, their grandparents putting their parent down, right? And I would even push it a step further and say, hey, we need to have a sit down conversation and say, listen, thank you for, uh, you know, your son or your daughter that you've given me in, in marriage, et cetera. But, you know, I honestly don't appreciate the way that you talk to me, right? So as a, as a human being, I honestly believe that you deserve to be talked to in certain ways. As a human being, you deserve to be talked to with respect. And if you don't feel that the way you're being talked to is respectable, then you can respectfully tell that individual, can you please not address me in these derogatory ways? If for whatever reason you're not able to, then we may have to change the way we communicate. That's called um, being responsible to and for yourself. When you give yourself the power to communicate to someone um, how you would appreciate being spoken to. Does that answer the question? I hope it does. I think so. I yeah. don't know. I think that's probably like, do you think that's easier said than done? Oh, no, no question. No question. Um, and of course, if it's an in-law situation, you talk to your spouse first and say, hey, listen, this is how they talk to me. Maybe they already know. Maybe, they, you know, they don't. Hey, how should we best handle this? Because this is really bothering me. It's affecting the way that I interact with you. It's affecting the way um, my kids interact with her. If my kids hear them, talk to me like that, that, you know, so I don't, you know, when, when you marry into a family, it's hard to differentiate where the circle is broken because everyone is interconnected, so to speak. And so um, those are conversations that definitely need to be, need to happen. Now, if this communication pattern was present before marriage, then it's something that you knew you were walking into. So by now, you should have some ways to, to mitigate that. But if this is a new behavior, something that just happened, I definitely think a conversation is due. Mm -hmm. And I think somewhere down the, down the road, they may not want to admit it, but the way that they talk to their in-laws, their son-in-law, their daughter-in-law like that could possibly be potentially believed, you know, they were taught that way. Like being mean to someone is a learned behavior. I fully believe that. It's a learned behavior. You saw it, um, you saw it done or someone talked to you that way. And then you regurgitate it because it was done to you. So you subconsciously do it to someone else. This in psychology, they call it transference. You subconsciously are talking to another individual as if they're the individual that they that initially hurt you. Right? So um I, I definitely don't think, you know, it's definitely not, it's definitely easier said than done, but it needs to happen. Absolutely. Yeah. Right, guys, is there anyone with a question out there? Anyone would like to ask Dr. Noah a question while we've got him on this platform? This is your chance to, you know, or maybe a comment, something that you've learned or something that you've heard that's really resonated with you this evening that you might want to share with somebody. Thank, thank you, doctor, for this advice. It's especially, you know, when you deal with your colleagues and your superiors at work. So Is that a question? I'm sorry, I didn't catch it. No, no, thank you for this advice, you know. It's especially helpful when you deal with your colleagues and your superiors at work. Yes, sir. Bless you. Absolutely. Yes, and, thank and, you. Absolutely. Thank you. Even, even at work, you know, this is not relegated to... Um, family relationships, familial relationships, this, this, man, some of us ha struggle having these conversations with um, our superiors or, or coworkers because that, that, that dollar, uh, you know, is at stake. So 
still, as a human being, you deserve to be spoken to with respect. You do. You really do. Yes. Yes, and okay. some Thank people, you, you know, um, Dr. Lawrence knows my dissertation is in dating, but in, in dating relationships, people love talk, people love engaging some people with people that talk to them certain ways because for some reason they believe um, that love is shown when people talk to you in certain ways, even if it's derogatory, right? Um, because they didn't learn that as a human being, you have, you are due respect. You are, you are due um, to be talked to in a certain way. Yes, doctor, thank you for that. Yes. Thank you. Um, do you have any Bible verses? Like my one of my favorite ones is I am fearfully and wonderfully made, you know. Oh, listen. I love and I love to just tell myself that, you know, so therefore, you know, God has not put me on this earth to be downtrodden. You know, I am, you know, do you have anything, any other encouragement that we can use? So I'm gonna give you a text that probably has become um <laughs> Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. For we are his workmanship. So one of the reasons why this become a favorite text of mine, because through the lens of that text, I understand that I am God's greatest design and I am God's greatest masterpiece. There is nothing that God created that's better than you and me. We, we, we are his masterpiece. Whatever, whatever you think is, is tight, is dope, is great, pales in comparison to his creative power when he, when he made you. So I definitely, uh, you know, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. That's one of my favorites um, as well. Um, but man, we are God's workmanship. We are, we are his we are a masterpiece of God is um, that's a pretty dope thought that, that, and it says that, um, you know, Jeremiah one teaches us another favorite text that um, he actually had a relationship with us before we came out of the womb, go figure that one out. Right. And so his pre conceptive, his prenatal, his pre-conceived uh, relationship with us, man, that's, that's, you know, Psalms also says that his thoughts toward us outnumber the sands of the sea. That's a lot of thinking. You ever been to the beach before and you put grains of sand in your hand and you, and you let the grains fall out of the sand, you can't really count how many grains that you picked up. And David writes in the Psalms and says, man, um, however many grains there are of sand, not just in one beach, think about the beaches all over the world. God's thoughts toward us outnumber all the grains of sands on any beach or beaches that's on the face of the earth. So, so if God thinks about us so much, um, we ought to know, you know, let, let me say it like this. If God thinks about us so much, then we ought to change the way we think about ourselves. That's what I want to say. Amen. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I've got um, um, a question, a comment from Lorraine. Thank you for your message. I like that we cannot be the same as we were before. You know, something's got to change. We need to move forward. I like that as well. Oh, definitely. What should we focus? What should be the focus of our church post? What should... What should be the focus of our church post COVID, particularly to engage young people? Nosy, you do not want me to get into that. <laughs> I will get fired. <laughs> they, will, they will call for my ordination. You do not want me to get in that. First, for, for two reasons. Number one, that question is layered for me, at least. Mm -hmm. And if, if I open that, um, we would be here for another two hours. Um, I'm trying to see how can I answer it in a succinct way? What should be the focus of our church after COVID? Mm. For our young people. I mean, I think mental health with our young so, people. So, 
this is going to sound weird, but I don't know if what I would articulate as what should be the focus of our church after COVID necessarily changes too much based on the demographic of our church. I think that young and old, number one, all need the same thing. I, I was telling somebody this just yesterday. I think number one, after COVID, you know, every church has a person that's over music at most churches. They have a music coordinator, a minister of music, we call them. Every church is going to have to have, in my opinion, a mental health person. Um, and I'm not saying that they're the person where, where everybody goes to, but at least somebody that has, you know, the resources. Uh, maybe it can fall in line with health ministries or whatever, but, you know, um, the Black community has been lagging terribly behind on mental health. We just starting to really get up on it and, and realizing its importance. Um, but the, the other thing I would say is, again, and this is loaded, so I'm, not, I'm trying not to go down this street. <sighs> I think that First of all, I think every church, every local church needs, to, and I'm, I'm not just saying this because I'm a pastor or a man of faith. Every church is going to have to take some, in my humble opinion, is going to have to take some serious time to pray, to fast, and to seek God and say, God, where are you leading us in this season? I know we have these ministries. I know we voted in these positions. I, I, I know this is the way we've been doing church. But for me, and you asked me the question, Nosy, so I'm just going to give it to you. For me, we need to take everything off the table and say, this is where we are in the world. God, based on where we are, what are you telling us to do? And I think if we go that route, see, 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 what I think we're trying to do is we're trying to just, I, I'm, I'm a big sports fan, so that I, this is the best analogy I can give. Like, we're, we're trying to play an offense or defense and just hope that it works instead of analyzing what the other team is doing and saying, okay, based on that, we just, we, so we're running, we've been running the same play and we've been running the same play for years and it has not been working. I don't know what's going on in, in, in UK. I can only speak for America, but what I'm saying is churches were on the decline before COVID. So let's, let's stop acting like COVID has totally interrupted church and it's caught. No, brothers and sisters, it was on the decline before COVID. Way before COVID, people was, people, uh, uh, attendance was down, money was down. And I don't know what's going on in UK, but money is also a great uh, camouflager because money, if you got money, it can camouflage other problems. And so I just, I just think in this season, to be honest with you, uh, church needs to get back to prayer. And, and literally ask God, God, what are you asking us to do in this season? Clearly. I mean, look, my brothers and sisters, we, we are seeing stuff we've never, uh, in the whole world, when the whole world ever stopped like this? Not in our lifetime. And, and, and so how, I, maybe y'all can, I'm, I'm not interested in it. How are you going to keep doing what you were doing when this has happened? The mental fragility, the amount of deaths that have taken place, um, the, the, the sense of, uh, you know, the Bible text, men's hearts are failing. That's where we are right now. How are we going to just keep running the same place? So, I got to maybe like 5% of your question, but I think it starts with the church going back to prayer, studying the word of God and, 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 and seeing where God is leading in this season. So. Yeah, a few comments coming in. 
Um, it's time for God to do a new thing. God has allowed the churches to close to help us to look at our relevance. That's true. You know, looking at how can we be living spending that time. Yeah. And, and God, God forbid, Nosy, God forbid that after COVID, me as a person, I'm doing the same thing I was before COVID. God forbid me in my church are doing the same thing we were doing before COVID. God forbid. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't understand why. I really, please, somebody make it make sense to me. But we are living in a time and season that is calling for new things. Let me give you this last text note here, because you asked me. I, I, I told you, I told you, you didn't want me to ask that, ask this question. I told you that. I told her, Doc Lawrence, but she asked anyway. Let me tell you where I sense God really wants to take us in this season. Are you ready for this? Yeah. Mark 16, verse 17. This is where I believe God is trying to take us. And these signs will accompany those who have believed in my name. They will cast out devils. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly poison, it shall not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. This is where I believe God is sending us in this season, and we can't get to that doing what we were doing. No way. No way. Our church has been, and I'm saying, I ain't talking about any one church. I'm just saying, by and large, our church has been political about positions and, and doing this. How, how are we going to get to laying hands on sick and they recover and, and speaking a new tongue? How are we going to get to that when we worried about who's going to be in position? Notice, notice the disciples were, were, were arguing about that before Christ died. But after he died and went to heaven, them brothers were sitting in the upper room because they knew something was about to change. And so this is where I think God is taking us in this season. And in order for that to happen, we've got to get back to prayer. We've got to get back to Bible study. We've got to get back to fasting and, and, and being more in community. And um, however that looks, you know, it's COVID, so it's tough. But that's, that's where I think God is taking us or trying to take us. And maybe he's been trying to do that for a while. We've just been resistant because we felt that what we had, the package that we had was so good that nothing needed to be changed because of it. Mm. Listen, I'm, I'm looking at the time and Pastor Lawrence, can I add you into this conversation? Please do. Like, is, would you like to add anything? Or what would I like to add? Well, <clears throat> well um, what my experience has been, uh, thank you, Nozi, is that um, as we went through the last two years and continue to go through some of the um, uh, impact of what has happened over the last two years, I hear a lot of people who are crying, crying for pain, all kinds of pain as a result of perhaps uh, fragmentation in a relationship, uh, fragmentation in what they thought um, was a, a, a family that they had that was together. Uh, fragmentation in every aspect of their lives. Fragmentation. And not only has it disturbed them, but they're asking the question, what has happened to me? Who am I? Yeah. You know, in all of this, am I still the person that God says that I am in him? And so uh, people have been trying to rediscover who they are in God. Uh, a lot of people are confused about their own identity in God. But the key thing is that I have realized over these two years is that um, what God has said to us in Isaiah 55 and verse 11 about us, his word about us, but who we are in him. Uh, Pastor Noah co quoted Ephesians 2 and verse 10, who we are in him has not changed. Mm. It has not changed. It is what God has said about us. What has happened is that things have happened around us and things has happened inside of us, uh, introspectively and introspectively. Those two forces have brought us to the place where we become confused about who we are in God. But God's word has not changed. He says, what I have said concerning your life 
it is what I said. It would surely happen and it would accomplish what I've said. So all of the detours, all of the bad things. Uh, this week, uh, yesterday, I'll say to somebody uh, that, uh, you know, uh, God uses bad things. Bad things are good for God. He uses bad things mm. in our lives. I believe God doesn't, yeah, here's this thing. He doesn't throw away the bad things that are happening to us in our life. No, he doesn't throw them away. He uses bad things that are happening to our lives, whether it's a relationship, whether what, what we thought of ourselves, whether it's it's about our cognitive dissonance, about confusion about ourselves, about other people, all of those things, God takes them, He takes them all and He makes use of them mm. concerning what He said to us. Mm. It may have been a detour in our lives, we've done things, gone to places. God takes the whole lot and he still accomplished his purpose for our lives. So uh, that is where I, I, I want to leave it tonight, that bad things happen to you that has caused you to doubt who God says you are in him yeah. before COVID, during COVID, and after COVID. I want to assure you that God's word concerning you, Isaiah 55 and verse 11, is authentic, is true, it will surely happen. There's nothing that can detour what God says um, about your life. So um, yeah, where I want to leave it. Um, and if there's no question, we want to pray because the time, our time has come to an end. Um, yes, take this confidence, take this, let it be your confidence that what God has said about your life, it is real, it is true, and it will come to pass. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you for that. Amen. I'm going to ask um, Dr. Noah, can you pray us out? Because our time has sadly come to a close. Hopefully, we'll be able to see you live and in person, you know, as things are shifting. But yeah. um, can you pray us out for the session? Father, I thank you because we are fearfully and wonderfully made and wonderful are your works toward us. Thank you that your thoughts toward us outnumber the sands of the sea. Thank you that we were we are your workmanship and created for good works that you had designed beforehand, before the creation of the world. Help us to see us like you see us. Mm. Give us your vision, God. Mm. Give us your wisdom, God, so that we would stop calling us, calling ourselves the names, the, 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 the improper names we've been calling ourselves. Help us to not uh, believe the lies that other people that have been calling us, but but we will believe the report of the Lord and we would count every promise in your word for ourselves and that we will be encouraged about how you think about us. So that as we transition and move through this season of COVID and whatever else is before us concerning it, God, help us to know that no matter how tough things get, you still have the whole world in the palm of your hands. And so, God, we rest in you because if there's two things we know about you, you don't change and you don't tell lies. And so thank you for this promise. I pray for everyone uh, that's on tonight, that's watching, that will watch later, and that you will bless them, that you will touch them, that you will reveal to them your will and your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.